Hey everyone, it's Andy Kushner, host of The Wedding Biz, in which I conduct in-depth and revealing interviews of icons and those who I feel are the next generation icons of the weddings and event industry. This is all to bring you education and inspiration so that you can hopefully feel more empowered. And if you've been listening to the show week after week, I want to welcome you back. Really appreciate your support. And I also want to thank those of you who are new to the Wedding Biz Podcast. We welcome you and suggest that you look over the back catalog of well over two years worth of just absolutely incredible episodes. And as I'm sure you all are noticing, I've started to take the show more international in that I'm interviewing wonderful industry pros from all over the world, beginning with Audrey Nerkoulis, a photographer out of Paris, also Greg Fink, another photographer based out of Paris, Rachel Berthissel, planner and designer out of Como, Italy, and of course, today's special guest who I'm about to introduce. I've also interviewed uh, that has not yet been released on the show, John Emanuel, uh, the premier floral designer out of Sydney, Australia. I will soon be interviewing Diane Curry, very popular planner designer out of Australia. And I recently interviewed Bruce Russell, a planner designer based in London, and Tara Fay, a planner designer based in Dublin, Ireland. I'm so excited about the growth of the show. So if you missed last week's episode, it was with Adam Schubel, who is an Instagram expert, uh, basically outside of the event industry. I really wanted to bring him in because he had fantastic tips for all of us on how to grow our audience through Instagram and, and also some other things we can do with it. And so this week's episode is with Reem Erodaki and her general manager, Greg Fink. Reem is a brilliant bridal designer uh, based in Paris. Uh, she calls her maison the bridal house for rebel goddesses, inspired by women who are unapologetically themselves. And basically, Reem has been designing wedding dresses and considers her part of this new generation who decided to shake up the traditional wedding codes to bring style and attitude in a very static and conventional industry. Greg runs the business side of Reem's business as general manager for a little over a year now, and they are engaged. And Greg is also a wonderful photographer who was on The Wedding Biz on October 14th. I'll have a link in the show notes. I want to mention that this interview of Reem and Greg was recorded before the Engage in London last October because Greg talked about his upcoming talk there on authentic branding. Just wanted you to be aware of that. And so, enjoy my conversation with Reem Erodaki and Greg Fink. Reem and Greg, it is so good to have you both on the show. And Reem, I know that you're in Paris and Greg, you're in New York City and I'm in Maryland. This is amazing modern technology. That's exciting. Thank you for inviting us. <laughs> yes, very much. Sure. And Greg, why are you in New York City? So I am in New York because I shot a wedding here uh, last weekend and I'm shooting another wedding in uh, Maryland in Baltimore next Saturday. So I'm spending the week in the U.S. before flying to London for Engage uh, on Sunday. Yes, and I know that you're going to be speaking at Engage. Absolutely. And for those listening, Greg was interviewed on The Wedding Biz. We released it a couple of weeks ago, and I learned that you're speaking on authentic branding, I believe. Isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely. I will be speaking about branding because I have a background in marketing. So I just love uh, talking about marketing and branding and share about that for wedding vendors and wedding professionals because most of them need business keys on these aspects. Yes. And I'm going to put a link to uh, your interview in this, in this interview that we're doing. And the reason that we have you on the line, Greg, is you, are, you run the business aspect of, of Reem's uh, business. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's correct. So most people don't know that because it's pretty new. It's been a year. And Reem will probably speak about that. But uh, she has such a great company and such a great brand. But we have a very, very strong development, so it required some business structure. So I've been the general manager uh, for a company since 12 months now. Wonderful. And and we're going to definitely come back to you at some point in this interview. Um, Reem, is it, is it true that you knew you wanted to be a fashion designer around the young age of four? Absolutely. I wanted to be a designer since forever. Um, it was just obvious since the very beginning because, I mean, I just love to draw. Uh, I just love to look at my mom and sister getting dressed. Uh, they had a strong sense of fashion. They educated me in that way. 
So it was part of my childhood, basically. And it just appeared to me so obvious that I wanted to do this job. And you didn't you imagine gowns for your Barbies, right? You had Barbie dolls and, <laughs> yes. and things like that. And you would imagine dressing them. Absolutely. Uh, I did steal um, like the scarves of my mom. She used to have like couture, couture scarves in silk and uh, like so many colors. And I actually didn't like the colored one. I love the white and black. I was already a minimal, a purist and uh, I was stealing them so I could do my own sews and own designs. And uh, it was fascinating and so exciting for me at the time. And and what about these fashion catalogs that I heard about? Yes, I mean, the web was not existing. We didn't have anything online, but we used to receive all these catalogs so you could order basically anything you wanted at the time. And I just wanted to do my own because I thought these ones were a bit too annoying, not very creative. And I just wanted to create like an haute couture catalog with like a real world, a real DNA, a real experience. So I was basically designing and drawing everything with the price under it, cutting all the pages and just assembling everything and give it to my mom and sisters so they could choose and pick what they wanted. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, it's so interesting. I mean, skipping forward for a moment, you know, you're, you're doing so well with your own house, Atelier. It, it's interesting, you know, like where, where do you think this comes from that, that you're so young and even though you enjoy seeing them dress and all of that, I mean, still, what do you think that is? I don't know. I mean, I guess, uh, it's because I all, I always had a vision and an ideal of my muse and woman. I always pictured myself in this woman and I just wanted to be, I wanted it to be real. And uh, I think I am what I sell. I am what I draw. And uh, since it's so authentic, I guess it speaks to the people. Yeah, I know that you're known for this, and it's also on your website, uh, that you, you write that the Rim woman is a feminist and a modern goddess, and self-confidence remains the best accessory. And uh, what else? You also write, I love this sentence, the Rim bride is a heroine out of a Sofia Coppola movie with messy hair, barefoot, young and sexy, natural and rebellious, yes. rebellious, a mix of Kate Moss and the famous French movie character, I don't know how to say this, Man Man Manon des Sources. Manon des Sources. Yes, Manon des, des Sources. Yes. I mean, and, 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 and it's just interesting that, that you were uh, already sensing all of this at such a young age as a teenager. So I know you had a very interesting story when you turned 18, but between the age of four and 18, how did this continue? How did this continue to manifest? I think I had parents that trusted me and always listened to me and to my voice. I told them I wanted to be a designer and they never ever forbid me or tried to pull me another way. Like they wanted to listen to me. So I felt free uh, since the very young age. So I could watch TV as much as I wanted. I didn't have any restriction because they knew I was educating myself. Mm. Uh, my sister was a pianist player. So music was part of our life since the very young age as well. So yes, I was just educating myself with like museums, uh, fashion magazine that I was stealing from my sisters, shopping that I was doing with her when she used to spend too much money on designers. But I was inspired. So I guess it made me what I am. So at 18, what is it that you happen I, I, that happened? I know there was um, some kind of a, an interesting conversation with your father. Yes, I did. I told him that I wanted to be a fashion designer, but... He was skeptical in a way that I was still a bit immature and young and he wanted me to be 100% sure of it. And he believed in me, but in a way he wanted to test me, I guess. So mm -hmm. these schools were very expensive and I told him that the London um, St. Martin School was the best at the time. McQueen, Galliano, they were all graduated from there. And he said, okay, let's go, let's see. He was a bit beyond our budget. So he said, can't you try to find one in Paris? Still pricey. So he said, okay, I have some money saved, but still, I want you to be part of it. I want you to participate to this. So it's really your, you own that project. It's not only your parents spending money on your uh, scholarship. So I just quit everything. I didn't go to school for a year. And uh, I found a job at Gap as a sales uh, stylist and then visual merchandiser. And that's how I saved 
money to pay the school. Wow, that's so interesting. You know, I grew up in a in a similar way. I was encouraged by my parents, especially my father, to and not exactly earn my own keep, but to definitely be involved. And I, I had a lawn mowing business. I started bands, all of this when I was a teenager. And and for college, when I finally went to college, I got I got some help with it, but I also was responsible for a portion of it, which I really liked. I liked it it helped me to feel empowered and maybe to lose a little bit of that sense of entitlement that I had when I was a teenager, you know? Absolutely. I love that word, empower. I think that's how I first started to gain some leadership in a way. So he didn't allow me to be someone who follows, but someone who lead the path, lead the journey, lead the way. So I guess that's why I always envision myself as someone who has her company as well. Yes. And and finding your voice, that was also a part of it too, wasn't it? Yes, definitely. Definitely. It was so important. And he always, it, like, he pushed me to be unique and not to be like anyone else. And if I, if I wanted to do this job, I had to be one of the best. Mm. I could not be average. Well, and finding your voice, you know, I know that in any aspect of the arts, that is the ultimate goal, you know, for, for all of us to find our own voice. How, do you, how did you go about doing that? I guess I uh, took it from my personal experience as well. Um, uh, in my dating experience, friendship experience, family experience, I guess I was observing a lot. I was quite a solitaire. I was lonely. I, I mean, I partied and I, I went out with my friends, but I was the best time for me was to be on my own in my room thinking and imagining things. I was a dreamer. So I just like took my magazines, do my mood boards and I just assembled and arranged everything I loved so deeply and I felt a connection with that uh, in a sense I think the mix of everything made my voice came to life. Mm. And then in 2007 you took that and launched your first company, isn't that right? <laughs> I did, which was a mistake and not at the same time because I just didn't want to work for others and I really wanted to have my own company and I just thought a bit naive that it was enough just to draw nice things and do pretty things. And uh, I did some fairs, fashion fairs, uh, presentations. I did so like I did sell, sorry, uh, a few pieces to shops, uh, even outside Paris uh, and it sold well, but I didn't have any idea of what cash flow was, production was. And so, yes, I mean, I failed in a way. I had to close down the company two years after that. My dad helped me a little to understand this, but it was just too early and I needed to work for others and found my voice again and again because I did have a style, but I didn't have any concept. So I needed to find that to be different. And you did this, you say, by then going back and working with, for other people. Absolutely. I did uh, some freelance for uh, high-end uh, luxury brands, for smaller brands. Uh, I did even some bridal freelance. So the whole mix of everything made me observe and learned. And uh, I mean, I worked from people. They taught me so many things. And uh, that's how I did. I learned and then I could finally get back to my own company again. So how did that start to happen? I mean, I, I know that it's interesting for so many people who have been on the show, friends or or just people would kind of come to them and, and start asking for their services. Isn't that what happened to you too? Totally. I think, I guess it's the easiest way uh, or network. So I always had a personal style in a way that I dressed very specifically, very unique so i guess my friends loved that style and they knew i had some experience in designing and they were like okay i'm getting married i don't find anything on the market uh, it's not like me i know you understand my style and you're young and modern and you're my friend could you do it for me so it happened a couple of a couple of times like on two years time and um, the more i had these friends coming over and the more i realized that something was missing and that i could do something in this world well, and, and what did you feel was missing? I mean, let's talk about what was your perspective on what was going on in the industry at the time. 
So it was 10 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, almost, and uh, all my friends were going to these bridal shops, and I'm talking about Paris, but I guess it was kind of the same in the rest of the world, where gowns were princess-like, Cinderella vision, stiff, not very comfortable, very big. And they all came up to me and said, I want my gown to be fashionable, trendy. Uh, I want to feel confident, feminine, but at the same time, I want to move and be free. So they just wanted to be a bridal gown, but with a fashion touch. And this was missing so much in this uh, bridal industry. So I just thought about mixing fashion and bridal and do something out of it. And and is this at the point, because I remember, you know, before we recorded, uh, started recording, you were telling me about how I believe this is the time when you really didn't have any savings and you needed to do something really efficient and you didn't even have a lookbook nor a collection. And so you then launched, I guess, while you're helping friends, you launched a blog, a fashion blog. Isn't that right? I did. I did. I did launch the blog at the same time that I was doing these gowns for my friends just to have a window to the world. And it's an online one because it doesn't cost anything. And I was quite good with WordPress at the time. So I did my own blog with, and I presented my sketches and photos and mood boards and even a little text to describe my ideal of the perfect bride. And I guess that's how I brought so many followers and readers there. And a few other wedding blogs noticed my fashion slash wedding blog talked about me and brought even more followers. And that's how it started. That's amazing. And and I want to come back for a moment again to your style. You know, we talked a little bit earlier and I, I if for people who have not seen it on your site, it says, uh, I believe on the homepage, bridal house for rebel goddesses. <laughs> <laughs> I love, yes. I mean, I love that. And then also inspired by women who are unapologetically themselves, wild and free. You know, I, I love that. I mean, can you still tell me more about that? And where did you come up with that phrase? That's a great branding statement, <laughs> Bridal House for Rebel Goddesses. Yes, actually, I don't know. It just came out naturally because I guess I love the rebellious side because it's someone who doesn't uh, follow the rules and who is free. And I guess I was myself a bit like that. Um, I come from a Middle Eastern background where... Um, I mean, it's a strong culture with so many good things and also some uh, challenges. And though my parents were very open-minded, they taught me to to be very family. How can I say that? Like they want me to be a family person, though I was very independent. I wanted to be free. And I mean, I was raised in France. My my, my friends were French so and uh, Occidental. So I didn't want to be too much part of this Middle Eastern background. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be French as a French woman with French culture and liberated myself. I wanted to be free in a way. And, um, and I guess the rebellious part comes also from that. How did your family feel about this cultural <laughs> shift you wanted to make? <laughs> it was not easy, not easy at all. I guess the person who understood me from the very beginning and was kind of the same was my dad because he's the one, he's the reason we're born in France. He's the one who left Middle East to come to France and do his own career in his own path. And his family was not very happy about it. So I guess we have a lot in common. But my mom and sister were a bit too, a bit more traditional. And uh, yes, that's how, I mean, we clashed a few times. But uh, I didn't let, let the choice. Well, but it's interesting. I love what you're saying, you know, also about your father really supporting you in that way and also modeling for you what it is to be an entrepreneur, you know, that attitude. Yes, yes. He, I guess he was very into educating his girls into powerful, empowered women because he didn't have any boys. So he wanted us to be strong women with strong personality, assets, and freedom, because he left Middle East to give us that freedom. Mm. He was obsessed with that. So, so yes, we were very lucky, very lucky in a way. Is he still around to experience, you know, your success today? Yes, absolutely. Uh, he still cries at every show. Oh, yes. that is, <laughs> wow, that's wonderful. Well, to keep going in your trajectory, so, you know, bringing us up to four years ago, 
I believe, 2015. Yes. I understand you decided to extend the bride's experience by adding to a ceremony collection. Can you tell me about that? Yes. So we launched the collection in 2011. We had what we call the ceremonial, which are the gowns. I just noticed, especially in France uh, and then in the U.S., of course, I noticed that uh, there was not much choice in bridal ready-to-wear. Uh, again, we had to go to ready-to-wear lines to find some white dresses, pants, suits. And I just wanted to help the bride to expe- extend the experience and make it easy for her. And again, to dive deep into a bridal fashion world where she can find everything she wants so we can be with her through the whole process and year before her wedding, which is the bachelorette, bridal shower, engagement party, uh, and then the welcome dinner, party after the wedding, and the brunch. So for the whole process, you need outfits and you need to look good. (laughs) So we just launched a line of bridal ready-to-wear and honeymoon pieces as well. All in white, uh, still have the codes of bridles, which is crepe, silk, laces, tools, Mm -hmm. and just put it online and make it easy to purchase. So with stock, and uh, that's how it started, the online experience. And then it was just a few years ago that you extended to the international market, right? Yes, absolutely. And we were kind of the, I mean, we were the first doing this and we're still uh, very like pioneers in the way because... Uh, there was no online shopping for bridal because everyone thought you would need to go to a shop, retail store, bring your mom, bring your friends. But for these ready-to-wear and easy pieces, I just thought it was so easy to pull out. So that's how it started. Yes. And then you went to was it bri- you went to Bridal Week in New York? Was it back? Was that your first one a few years ago? Yes, it was in 2016. So. Uh, again, we had so many requests from the U.S., so many requests saying, I love your style. I feel it's like me. I look so close to what you say, what you create. Uh, I wanted to be part of it. So we just thought naturally that it would be a good idea to do our first New York Bridal Week and meet our first retailers and see how it goes. So what was that experience like for you? It was a dream, and I'm not going to lie, and you still can look at it uh, on Facebook because we recorded a live We all cried, Greg included. Uh (laughs) Uh, It was a very powerful experience because, I mean, maybe for Americans, Paris is the dream. But for us, to make it in New York was kind of a big step for us. So having our first show there was immense, big. And of course, it was successful because we had so many good reviews and and retailers just came to, to buy our collections. That's wonderful. And, and you know, in a few minutes, I, I want to get into some of the business aspects of this and bring Greg into it. Mm-hmm. But before we do that, wh- I understand that w- one of the first celebrities to order one of your pieces at Bridesmaid's Dress was Meghan Markle? Yes, she was. Can you tell me about that? Yes, it was. It was insane. I mean, I'm going to be honest here. I didn't watch the show Suits. It was my youngest uh, colleagues who told me, oh, my God, I love the show. She was not with Prince Harry at the time. Uh So I have to say here, I run my Instagram alone. I'm the only one and still doing it. Amazing. Well, yeah, we're going to come back to that too. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Yes, yes. So I just saw a DM from a girl named Megan Markle who had so many followers, looked insanely good, saying, I love your work. I want to support. I have a fashion blog and I want to be, I want to talk about you and I want to wear one of your designs. Uh, how is it possible? I have one of my best friend's wedding soon. Could you please tell me how to proceed? So... I just uh, reached out to her. Then she gave me her stylist contact. We exchanged a few mails and I did a gown for her, not white, but blush color. And we just did send it to to her in Canada. She was there at the time. We were not very lucky about it. Experience again. It was stuck in customs. Oh, no. Yes. So she didn't get the dress in time. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. A bit like, but she knew we did everything. It was very short notice. My production team was very small at the time. So we did just everything we could to do this gown in a like record time. <laughs> like it was really, really difficult. But uh, yeah, she didn't get it at the end. So 
we felt so bad, so guilty. So we sent her back a box full of gifts, like with caftans, jumpsuits, t-shirts, jackets. And she felt so, so, so happy. And like she, she was touched about it. And she said to me, I know you did your best. It's not your fault. I'm going to repost about it. And thank you for what you wow. did because you're amazing. Wow. Yes. She was so classy. Best experience at the, at the time. And then we didn't hear from, from her for a while. So I was, oh, maybe she forgot. And I didn't want to be too pushy as well. And then I just found out that she posted my T-shirt on Instagram saying, oui, je l'aime à la folie, which means, yes, I do love him so, so much, like crazy. And I was like, who is she talking about? And then she actually used this post and this T-shirt to announce to the world she, that she was in love with Prince Harry. Oh my God. Wow. Yes. How has that been for your business pr uh, promotion wise? <laughs> we were sold out of this t-shirt in like one day. <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> of course. And of course other t-shirts. And I guess, yes, that's, that's when we started to have on the eShop, especially uh, a UK and US clientele for good, like a big one. Mm, yeah. Wow. Well, I'd like to also ask some about your process. What, when you're conceptualizing, you know, and then designing and then marketing a new collection, what is the process like for you? It's kind of different. Some designers would go to museums, travel, choose some fabrics, draw, and then shoot the campaign or the lookbook. I kind of do the opposite. I need to know what kind of campaign and lookbook and video I want to I wanna do before because I want to tell a story. So the, the storytelling is my starting point and then I can draw and design my gowns. But I always envision the campaign and the marketing before the, the collection itself. Do you have a technique for being able to pull out what you need in order to tell that story, to understand what it is? I guess... The fashion, uh, my fashion background helps a lot. I, I reviews my Vogue magazine, vintage ones as well. I'm a huge fan of like French and Italian Vogue. And sometimes I just see their editorials and, and the desert by night, all the stories and even like the old campaign and lookbook I can see on Pinterest from Chanel, Saint Laurent. And I just take from there and from there and from there and just mix it all and make it mine. Mm. Isn't it true? Dressing someone really is an art. It is. It totally is. I guess people think getting into the bridal business or being a, a designer is easy. I think you definitely need to know how the body of a woman is made. So different body shapes, so different personalities. You need to make them blossom with their skin tone, with their attitude, the way they stand. It's so different and so unique. So I guess I guess school and also my French background and culture helped me a lot in that. Well, also, you know, I'm thinking as you're saying that different body types and all of that and helping them to blossom, you're dealing with a lot of vulnerability of your brides, aren't you? Absolutely. That's the perfect word. Vulnerability. And I mean, we're part of one of the most important moments in their life beside giving birth. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yes, it's. We're, we, we become family to them, uh, friends, sisters. We also deal with their family problems sometimes or issues because that's a moment where they bring them to the table. They bring them to the showroom. So we hear they talk together, sometimes fight, sometimes laugh, sometimes cry. And we're in the middle of it. So we need to be very, very smart and to step in, but at the right moment and not to be pushy. And at the same time, having this little chit chat in the fitting room so they can feel enough close to you to trust you. Yeah. Well, and so what advice would you give to a bride? I mean, of course, there's so much you could say, but what would you say some of the main advice you could give to a bride when thinking about and choosing her dress? I guess two things. The first thing would be to listen to your gut and trust yourself because today we have two type of brides we have one that follows what her moms or friends says which are the right. toughest ones yeah. yes and often the youngest ones as well and then we have the 30 something bride that pays her gown by herself like she's independent so she's not going to come 
with a bunch of people. Sometimes she comes alone and she's the easiest one because she knows who she is. She's, she's been through a lot. She has different men in her life sometimes. So she's not like a princess anymore. She's not a little girl. She's a woman and she's definitely what I call a babe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how about for a wedding planner? I'm sure you also work with planners. Yeah. For the planners who don't have someone like yourself available and they have to work directly with their bride to help them in mm-hmm, the beginning, mm-hmm. do you have any advice mm-hmm. how to do that? Oh, man. I mean, planners are so amazing and they know, I mean, they usually know about it and they know so many designers and they know about dealing with the families. But for the gown part, I would say to always not give them too much choice in uh, among the de- designers. Yeah. Yes, because the more choice you give, the more lost they will be. So I guess you maybe need to make a little questionnaire to, and maybe ask them a Pinterest born of what they love. Uh, like the, maybe to ask them, okay, give me three type of gowns or designers that you love. And then according to this, say, okay, you need to go to this place, this place, this place, mm. and that's it. And we stop there and that's it. Yeah. And then, after they chose their gown, I usually recommend not to go and scroll wedding gowns on Instagram anymore <laughs> because <laughs> then it confuses you more. And what about uh, advice for thinking about and choosing bridesmaids dresses? I'm going to be honest here. This is something that we're not into yet <laughs> because it's so competitive and usually they go on ready to wear brands. But uh, um, yeah. I know in the, I know in the U.S. they're like it's very different in the U.S. They love to have same color, same gown for everyone. And you guys have amazing brands for that. And here in France, they love to give the choice and just give a color. And then the bridesmaid goes by herself and buy for her. So it's very different. The habits are not the same. But I would love the bridesmaids to be a bit more modern mm, again. Yeah. And also uh, good looking as well. Some I always tell my brides that they should not be afraid of their guests to look good. Yeah. Because... It looks so photogenic. And if you feel confident in your gun, you will still be the the muse of the day. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. The bride gets the most attention of everybody, you know, absolutely, even absolutely. more than her groom. <laughs> so I want to bring you into it, Greg. I know that you're also in, uh, married <laughs> to Reem. So, you know, there's a whole question about how you work together. But before we go there, how did you see Reem's business when, you know, she, you, the two of you started to talk about working together? What did you see that she was doing and, and where did you feel that it needed to go? So Reem and I met uh, through the wedding industry five years ago. No, actually, we've been together for five years, but we've known each other for longer than this because we used to be friends before that. Uh-huh. And I knew of Reem's business because she's she was already big in France. So I was kind of very looking up to her business and looking up to her brand. And I mean, you have listened to her speech. Her vision is so clear, has always been so authentic. So um, I was not really worrying about our business. I was more worrying about my business and how I could make it as a wedding photographer. And it's only been over the past couple of years that she grew so quickly that she started to meet some big challenges in terms of how to structure the growth, how to keep that path of growth like internationally, how to enter the U.S. market. And because I come from a business background, I felt like I could bring something to the table. So it's not been an easy discussion at the beginning because I was not the go-to person to do that. Um, She had a couple of general managers before me. That I was disappointed about. And to be be honest, it was not working well at the time with them. Hmm. So I guess, I guess it was just the right time 12 months ago. My business started to be solid enough. I have good relationship with my wedding planners. Um, I book amazing clients. As a photographer, just so everyone is clear. As a, as a photographer, yeah. sorry. So my photography business didn't require as much time as it did in the, in the first years. So that's when I decided to give him a hand. And once again, I see so much potential in a brand. I see so much potential in a company. And of course, because we're husband and wife, I mean, not yet. Uh, we're getting married next year. Yeah. But because we're husband and wife, it was just natural for me to help her. 
And coming from a business background and having these capabilities, it was just so frustrating for me to see her struggle in some aspects that I kind of master when seeing that her vision and authenticity and brand are so strong. So what were some of the first steps that you took? The starting point was, I need you, I mean, I was telling Greg, I need you to tell me what is the the next big idea, but how can I be ready to do this next big idea? And how can I support this growth, uh, handle the production needs, handle the cash flow needs, and just have a, a good plan and strategy to to go where I want to go. So he said, okay, let me have a look at it. Uh, and he started just to come to the, to the office, talk with the team, uh, do some meetings and see what was good, what was wrong. And that's how it all started. Yes. What we need to have in mind is that a lot of wedding vendors, me included, um, we work from home, wedding photographer, wedding planners, wedding designers. I mean, except for the big ones, most of these companies don't require a lot, a lot of investment. You can work behind a computer, you can just design a website and with Instagram or with your communication, uh, you can get clients. Being a bridal designer is a different animal. Uh, Reem has 20 employees right now. She has a huge production line, huge cost. And, um, the question is how you can go from designing a dress on your couch 10 years ago to a $5 million company just 10 years after that. There's a lot of challenge coming with it. And uh, you, the question is how do you go from the phone is ringing all day with people wanting to carry your, carry your dresses in the US, uh, in Hong Kong, in the Middle East, and how do you structure that growth to make sure that you make the right strategy choices, that you go to the right markets, that you invest the right money on the right items? Um, and this has been most of the work for the past year. Boy, when you describe this, it sounds completely overwhelming to me, <laughs> what you were taking on. <laughs> it was, I have to say, uh, and I'm not saying this because he's a, uh, my uh, husband to be it's it was quite kind of hectic this last year because he had to deal with these two jobs and of course he's so talented and good at it but it was kind of challenging not only to deal with uh what we had to change and structure but also with the people and because the 20 people that works for me were not already to accept this challenge and these changes oh, and that's interesting yes, yes and this was i guess the most uh, challenging part and a first for both of us because uh, even Greg didn't experience this ever so it was kind of new yeah greg what was that like for you how did you how did you do this <laughs> how did you do it <laughs> it was difficult because coming from uh, so i worked 10 years for Procter and gamble so big company big corporation as a marketing executive if i remember from your interview as a sales and marketing executive exactly yeah. so i was managing teams i was managing like pnls uh, big sales, big brands, and as of a sudden, you're in this small company, but not that small because it's growing so quickly. But you have to deal with 20 employees when on my own, on the photography business, I've been working by myself for the past five years. And uh, some of these employees, they've been here for um, 10 years. Some of them were interns. Some of them uh, were not trained. So the human part of it was the most difficult one because on the business aspects, you kind of know what you have to do. But the question is, how do you embark people with you? Or do you make people accept change and yes. embrace change? Yes. And this was the most challenging part of it. And, and I'm sorry, I, I guess also the, the toughest part was also on my side because I had the responsibility in it, of course, because my team and also the way I handle things and lead things before was I'm a designer and I have my team to execute and do the things mm. that I envision. But I never took part, I guess, because I didn't have the business background also. It was not not maybe easy for me or natural to me. Uh, I just thought it was their job to do it. But in a way, Greg stepped in and said, no, you are the designer, but you are the leader here. So 
you need to tell them what to do. They need to do what you train them for. And of course, I didn't train them. I just hired some young people to do the job. And some of them were very inexperienced. So it was kind of amazing at the time. But when the challenges came, came, came along, it was a bit more tricky. And Andy, I want to say it here, but your show has been such a big help for us in the past year. Yes. Because she does, she doesn't know it, but Cindy Novotny is my mentor. Uh -huh. So Rim and I have been listening to her <laughs> oh, yes. shows over oh, and yes. over. And she oh, says yes. something which is very true, which is it always comes from the business owner. So you cannot blame people. You can, you cannot blame their behavior. If something is wrong with them, look at yourself. Look at, yes. look at how you lead your company. Do you do feedbacks? Do you train them enough? And um, listening to Cindy's shows on, uh, on your show again and again has been such a big help for us. Absolutely. Oh, that's wonderful to know. And I, she, uh, she, uh, she will find out about this. That, that's wonderful. So I, I want to ask also about social media, how you all work how you incorporate social media. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm ha I, I really am asking this now of everyone that's on the show because it is obviously an extremely powerful marketing tool that if anyone is not utilizing it effectively, then they're missing out. And, and I know, Reem, at this point, just as of today, you've got almost 200,000 followers. Mm -hmm. You're telling me that you run your Instagram alone. I do. So I would love to hear your your perspective on Instagram and then how both of you, how you incorporate it, you know, from a business perspective yeah. and if you have strategy. I mean, I was kind of a, an early bird on Instagram. I did launch it like eight years ago. I mean, at the very beginning, almost. And um, I guess it was also so natural to me to talk about who I was and who my bride was at the time. So it started naturally with not much strategy or agenda there but then as soon as my gown started to sell and uh, we had more success more and more i just saw a boom on my instagram followers uh, especially after each launch if each new campaign and again as i said earlier to me video campaign and photo shoots and the mood board about the collection was so important and that's how i just build my community of followers because they just loved to see all these new videos each season, all these new campaigns, all these new storytelling, and they felt proud of it. And I guess I also used, when I, I wrote my uh, captions, I always said, hello loves, hello babes, this is Reem. So I was very, uh, yes, I was in, like uh, engaging them to be part of these Reem Aradaki babes community. So I guess that's how it started. And also something beside the fact that I ran my Instagram alone before and I'm still doing it because I saw, I saw it was a success. I, so I didn't need to do any corporate posts. Like I didn't pay any of my posts. So nothing was sponsored. I never paid for any followers. So everything, uh, these growth was so organic, like hundred percent. So I guess I, I thought it was a good idea to keep it to myself. I wanted to mention we have definitely included Instagram in our communication strategy this year because what we realized is that RIM used to have one big video and photo shoot for a campaign. And people right now with Instagram, they get tired of things so quickly. It's like you show content during like a couple of days and then they want to see something else. So for example, this year we have worked so much on the sequentiality of the launches with much more content. So for example, instead of having one big video for the new collection, we're going to have small videos for each dress. Um, we go have to have much more content so that we can feed Instagram and communication much more regularly. Mm. Wow. Well, and and it does seem that Reem, you've established a brand voice by handling Instagram yourself, right? That's mm -hmm. an advantage to it. But how aren't you? I mean, how many hours a week or even a day? I would think that it is hours. It doesn't it take much. a lot. Too much. Yeah. Too much. <laughs> 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 well, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't count. But yes, I I guess not all day every day, but. 
I would say twice an hour, I go check and I go do something, DMs, posts. So you're engaging a lot with your followers too. Absolutely. I respond to every DMs, every DMs. Yes, I do. Yeah. You know, I want to say I was interviewing uh, Edgar Zamora in, in Los Angeles. Uh, he designs furniture and that's so much more. That It's a wonderful interview too. But he was telling me that his business experienced a change partly when he insisted to his company that everybody, including himself, respond even to every single new like that they're following every every new follow they get they write a dm and thank them oh my god and i've been doing that and that has led to you know facilitating some conversation and more engagement with people that's amazing I, i'm not to that point and i guess i could try but then greg is gonna kill me you're getting thousands yeah. and thousands of followers so that's <laughs> yes, a that's yes. a tough one I do. That's a tough one. Yes. I was talking about that in my in my podcast, but humility is so important for me. Yes, you did. And we work in a relationship business. I mean, either we are wedding planners, cake designers, wedding photographers, bridal designers. It's a relationship business and we cannot undervalue humility, responding to everyone, being kind to everyone. And this is something really important to me that I have also tried to impulse to Rim's business. And where would you like to be? Where would you, I'd like to hear from, you know, both of you, where would you like Greg to see the company go in five years, 10 years from now? Mm, that's a tough one. <laughs> Here you go. Do you think that far ahead, both of you? <laughs> oh, yeah. We do. I think today Rim has a voice which is unique uh, on the bridal market. There are no other bridal designer with the same proposition, uh, with such a strong branding, such a strong story, such a strong vision for women. I think RIM has been um, ahead of other designers in terms of style, but also uh, market changing, like embracing Instagram very quickly, embracing e-commerce very quickly. And we all know that the retail model right now for bridal is to be reinvented. Mm. Habits are changing. The brides want something different. The brides are all over Instagram. They don't have time. They have much more choice. So I think Rim's brand is so unique in all of these aspects. So the, the, the biggest uh, challenge for the company right now is definitely taking over the U.S. markets because competition here in the US is nothing like Europe. It's much more difficult. And the brand right now is very much established in Paris, in London. We have a very strong market in Europe. But the question is how we're going to perform on the US market. So this is definitely going to be uh, all of our efforts for the, the next five years. Definitely. Wow. Rim, how do you feel about all that? Excited. I'm not scared. <laughs> I, I'm not surprised. <laughs> I'm not scared. I'm very excited. I'm not worried, but at the same time, I know that's going to be a lot of effort, a lot of work. Um, as Greg said, I know our differences and I know our assets. And I guess that's why American women come to us. And I, and I guess they love it. And I mean, we're also from Paris and the DNA that comes out of it, the fact that we're French, uh, French savoir-faire, know-how, fabrics. I think all this is a, is a real asset and a differentiation to the rest of the, uh, the designers. But at the same time, retail is kind of uh, like suffering and struggling right now. So I guess we need to reinvent the experience, the bridal experience here. So we're just going to brainstorm one more and we'll come with a good idea, I guess. Mm. Well, I'm very excited to follow and watch your business and your art continue. And perhaps we'll check in again with you in a year, you know, and <laughs> oh, yes. we love that. I think that would be really interesting. So, so Reem and Greg, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, this has been wonderful. Thank you for inviting us, Andy. Yes, it was very exciting. Thank you for having us. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Reem Erodaki and Greg Fink. Be sure to check out the website of Reem at reem erodakicom That's R-I-M-E-A-R-O-D-A-K-Y.com. I'll have that in the show notes as well if you missed it. Her Instagram and Pinterest is Reem Erodaki. And on Facebook, it's Reem Erodaki Paris. Again, all of this is in the show notes. And be sure to check them out at theweddingbiz.com. Please, if you enjoyed today's episode, share with your friends and colleagues and give us a wonderful review wherever you get 
your podcast from. That means a lot to me. And don't forget to listen to our follow-up segment, The Next Level, which comes out on Wednesday, in which I have a guest co-host. And together, we talk about some of the highlights of the interview of the week and help break them down and deliver them as specific tactics and tips for you to raise your own business to the next level. And this week's guest co-host is going to be Carrie Goldberg, the travel and weddings director at Harper's Bazaar, where she oversees all things bridal, weddings, and travel for bizarre.com. And I want to mention uh, that I am going to take next week off. <laughs> I, have, I don't think I've had a weekend, a week off ever on this show. And so for the holidays, going to take a break, but want to, again, encourage all of you to look at the back catalog. There's so many episodes that you could catch up on. And I want to thank our sponsor of today's episode. It's Kushner Entertainment. If you want absolutely incredible over-the-top music and entertainment with a very high-touch aspect to it, uh, be sure to go to kushnerentertainment.com. And we'll catch you next week on The Wedding Biz. Wedding Biz.